Blog Talk Radio. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. And I am the light within your soul In the essence of truth and right Love makes the circle whole And here we stand in line Waiting for some sacred sign But to find the balance is the purpose of this time to restore the balance of the universal mind And in the presence of my Lord of light and love Everything I see aspiring to be free And when I call to thee And come on bending knee Surrender to the all-pervading light and love Reflections of the one surrounding me with love And I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence Within and without, above and below, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. Without and within, below and above, yeah, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. Shabbat Shalom, I sense 
advent, Shalom, Holy Angel of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. The first Earth Goddess Rising Retreat is set for July 11, 12, and 13 of 2014 and will be held in stunning Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Come join us with other men and women from around the world for yoga, meditation, classes, organic meals, dance, and music festivities, healing workshops, hot mineral springs, and more. Want more information? Visit EarthGoddessRising.com and cash in on the early bird ticket sales, EarthGoddessRising.com. Thank you for joining me here tonight on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols-George, and I'm your hostess this evening. The music you were listening to there at the beginning of the show is I Sense Your Presence. It's by Shem Shai, great uh, group I met while I was in the Arizona area, met them in the Sedona region there. And I want to extend a welcome, whether you're returning to us or whether you're joining us here for the very first time. We are now streaming live in three additional places, Talk Stream Live, Stream Finder, and Penn, also known as Pair Encounters Network. And I welcome everybody listening through all of those channels as well. And I also want to extend a message of appreciation to our sponsor, Earth Goddess Rising, who's our uh, sponsoring the show this evening for us. Now, here at Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, I look at the different ways that compassion exists in our lives, how to remove our blocks, resistances, frustrations, and more. And some weeks I'm discussing different aspects of how compassion's in our life, how it affects our life and the different areas of compassion. And then some weeks I'm doing more exercises, practical implementations, and many times I will have guests on the show, just like tonight. Matter of fact, most of the time I do. And that way it gives you a chance to learn about other people's work and how that complements and works with compassion. And I also will be highlighting different musical artists along the way. Last year I was very blessed to have Stephen Halpern and Peter Cater on, and Uh, working on lining up a couple of other really great musical guests, so I'm just waiting on some final information from them. And in my own work, what I do is I focus on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday lives. I've created the Genesis Clearing Statement, and if you've missed that, you can actually check it out in our archives. And I've authored four books, the most recent being You, Me, Life, Dreams, and its companion workbook, and then my first two books, which were Activating Compassion and also Activating Compassion, the workbook. In addition, I've created the Compassion Tour, a multi-state nationwide tour, including workshops, retreats, seminars, book signings, fundraising events, a little bit of everything on there, you might say. And you can actually follow all of my live events that are happening and going on at Jesse Ann Nichols George. That's my full name, J-E-S-S-E-A-N-N-N-I. C-H-O-L-S-G-E-O-R-G-E dot eventbrite dot com. And just a reminder, if you enjoy the show this evening, make certain that you tell those friends, family, you know, share it with you know, those Facebook connections out there and anybody else that you might feel inspired to share it with because I know when I share things, people always seem to get excited. There's somebody out there going, oh, I was just having a conversation about this or you know, I was just thinking about this the other day, so it's the perfect thing. So you never really know. There could be just the thing that shifts or changes somebody's life or helps them out a little bit. And I know some of my Buddhist friends were like, oh, this is going to be so great this evening <laughs> when they saw what the topic was tonight. And uh, they can just use the same link you did to get into our live show uh, and listen to it at their convenience. And the other thing they can do is go on to my website, Jesse Ann Nichols George, the number one dot com, and just go to my page under the Main Street Universe tab, and I've got all of the archive shows there. In addition, they can get it as a podcast on iTunes and TuneIn.com, and uh, also on my YouTube channel. They can also find a, a YouTube version, which usually goes up about 24, within about 12 to 24 hours after the show is over. Now, before we get started this evening, those that have listened in before, you know that I enjoy delving into a little book called The 72 Names of God by Yehuda Berg, and I like to pull a little message for the week, and this also goes on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website. And it's always great, because Yehuda works the way I do. He likes to 
put things into everyday language and and simplify them into to our lives and and I think that that's great work. Now the message that we've got tonight here is unconditional love. I think that's perfect for our guest actually tonight. And uh, what he says here, the message he's got to go with it, is a student once approached a sage who was well-versed in the spiritual doctrines and mystical arts. He asked the master to teach him all the sublime secrets of life, to explain all the magnificent mysteries of the cosmos that are hidden in all the holy books. And he asked if all this could be done in the time that a person can remain balanced on one leg. He smiled warmly and replied, Love thy neighbor as thyself. All the rest is commentary. Now go and learn. And the insight Yehuda gives on this is, loving our neighbors, or our enemies for that matter, has nothing at all to do with morals or ethics. Rather, Kabbalah teaches that love is a formidable weapon in furthering our own cause in life, which is simply to gain true joy and fulfillment. In other words, we benefit. Love is a weapon of light. It has the power to eradicate all forms of darkness. That is the key. When we offer love even to our enemies, we destroy their darkness and hatred, which is the reason they become our enemies in the first place. What's more, we cast out the darkness inside ourselves. What's left are two souls who now recognize the spark of divinity they both share. This name also awakens love for our spouse, friends, family, and self. After all, we can share only what we possess. Thus, we cannot love our neighbor or our spouse if we don't possess a love for our own self. Use this name to, to dissolve animosity and bitterness that might arise after an argument with loved ones. And the meditation Yehuda gives with this is, like attracts like. By emulating the Creator's unconditional love for all humankind, you bring love into your own life. You create harmony between yourself and other people and between humanity and the natural world. And the way that this name is pronounced, again, the common name is unconditional love, but the more formal name, so to say, is Hei Hei Ayan. That's Hei Hei Ayan, and that's a great message that we've got from Yehuda tonight. Now, a little thought here before we head off on break and bring our guests back in and uh, get started with our guest tonight. What patterns do you continue to follow in your life? Are there ones that you really have a hard time breaking? Have you ever wondered what keeps those patterns locked into place? Patterns are something that exist in all of life, and this seems to parallel the larger workings of the universe. Many have associated patterns with negative programming or behaviors that they follow. However, I feel that patterns can be either positive or negative for us, depending on how we view them and what we do with them. Personally, I have had many patterns that led to great lessons in my life. There are going to be patterns that we want to keep and patterns that we want to change. This seems to be completely subjective to the individual. A sort of what works for one person may or may not work for another person. It seems to me that it rarely comes down to what works for you and what doesn't. I should say not rarely, but really. <laughs> and that it really comes down to what works for you and what doesn't. And, uh, and we have to know that, what is going to work for us versus somebody else. And the tricky part for, for most people is when they are ready to change the patterns they have in their life, there are traditional ones like stopping addictions, and then there are more subtle ones such as passive-aggressive behaviors, manipulation, self-sabotaging relationships. Now, Paul Jaffe brings in Buddhist, Zen, Tibetan practices and more as a means for changing patterning. And he has found that an integrated approach that brings the complex or abstract into something tangible helps to make the connection between the bigger pattern and everyday life. In all of my own work, I've found this to be a very important part of making shifts, 
changes, and transformations. People need to be able to both see and understand the pattern as well as see how it is working in their everyday life, and not just as a concept that is a never-ending spiral to it, but it, it is when this happens that we seem to get the proverbial aha, and the light bulb gets turned on, and thus we can get proactive in the process of transformation. Processes and being actively involved is a whole other reason why we need to understand the way it practically implements into our everyday lives. In my experience, when people have made this connection, they will then be able to see the results of taking the steps to change patterning. If they have not understood the connection to start with, then it's very difficult to see the results that are happening, and that then starts a cycle of discouragement, frustration, and abandoning the changing process. What are your patterns? Are there ones that you are ready to change and transform? How are they playing out in your everyday life? This week, our guest focuses on a component of compassion that's related to the aspect in my books of waking up. Here we focus on learning more about ourselves so that we can be what we would like to be in the world and be a true co-creator with the divine. I'm going to take a short break, and when we return, I will have Paul Jaffe with us, and he's going to be sharing his work on changing patterning. And let's go ahead and move on to break. We'll be back in a few minutes. And the song I've got for you tonight during our break is Waves. It's by Claire Hedin. And uh, Claire actually was on our show a while back. It's a great archive to catch, by the way, with her. And if you would like to find out more about her work, you can do so at www.clairehedin.com. And that's C-L-A-R-E. H-E-D-I-N dot com. We'll be back shortly.
The first Earth Goddess Rising Retreat is set for July 11, 12, and 13 of 2014. Embrace your divine feminine and balance the masculine. Nourish your body, mind, and spirit with a three-day program intended to inspire, clear, and heal your being. You don't want to miss out on the great early ticket sales. Need more information? Explore earthgoddessrising.com. Cash in on the early bird ticket sales today. earthgoddessrising.com. Welcome back. You are listening to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. And my name is Jessie Ann Nichols-George. I'm your hostess this evening. You were just listening to a song by Claire Hedin called Waves. And if you'd like to check out more of her work, you can do so at www.clairehedin.com. That's C-L-A-R-E-H-E-D-I-N.com. And also a special thanks to our sponsor tonight, Earth Goddess Rising. Definitely worth checking them out. And I would like to bring on my guest tonight, Paul Jaffe, a practitioner of meditation and studies, Buddhism, and other wisdom teachings for 40 years. He has studied with renowned masters in the Zen Vipassana and Tibetan traditions, including Mazumi Taizan, and I I hope I'm getting some of these right, (laughs) these pronunciations, Taizan Roshi, Bernie Glassman Roshi, Ginpo Merzel Roshi, um, H. H. Gayalwan Drukshan, and Tolku Erdwin Rinpoche. In 1997, Paul met Namgal, Namgil Rinpoche and Akarya, oh gosh, I hope I'm not butchering this, Paul, <laughs> uh, Doug Duncan, and began studying in this creative and forward looking lineage. He has been teaching various forms of meditation since 1980. Paul was involved in the founding of Dharma Japan and the Clear Sky Meditation and Study Group. He returned to the U.S. in 2012 after living more than 20 years in Japan. His teaching style reflects his diverse interests, spiritual traditions, social and environmental issues, intercultural understanding, business, communication, and healing. Paul has also worked in the financial world, had a career in university education, and worked training business people, professionals, and government employees for the past 24 years. And we're looking tonight at his work in changing patterns and meditation. And uh, to learn more about his work, you can go to www.stepsoffreedom.org. Paul, welcome to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Jesse. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's great to be here and talk with you. You know, it's a, um, you've got just a, a huge list of names and people and things there, so uh, I'm going to let you start off by sharing a little bit about who Paul is and how did Paul get into this journey that he's on right now. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it's been a long journey, so that's a big story. I'll try to hit some of the essential points. Uh, if I guess I could start the story when I was in college and I came to what I guess would be called a kind of identity crisis or a crisis of meaning in life. And uh, I struggled mightily, kind of very profound sense of, a lack of any meaning and real confusion in my life to the point I came for to a few weeks where I just wandered around my campus, couldn't sit in a lecture for five minutes, wandering around, couldn't find peace anyway, anyhow, and just struggling with that nonstop day and night. And then one morning I woke up 
it was a clap of thunder uh, from lightning. It must have hit very close. I woke up, and suddenly I looked at the curtains in my room, and it was just amazing to me that anything existed. It seemed like a total miracle that anything existed. And beyond that, uh, the curtains had a pattern on them, which was all the more miraculous. So I had this sudden shift of my whole perception. Uh, And actually looking back on it, it's very interesting. Uh, Now, I guess in a certain way when I'm training people, I'm trying in a way to get people to stay in that space of unknowing without clinging, without escaping from what's uncomfortable, without uh, grasping after what looks desirable and to just embrace the experience that they're having in the moment. Uh, And I really understand this as a key point in the path to freedom. By the way, the uh, website is is .org. Thank you for correcting that. I I have it listed correctly in our show description. I just didn't get it correctly when I said it. So thank you for that. Sure, no problem. And, And all those names, you know, I guess the people who, need those names, well, you know, find some of them on my website and uh, they'll get what they need. So I wouldn't worry too much about, uh, you know, how the pronunciations went. But, you know, that's how it goes when you start dealing with uh, Japanese and Tibetan on strange names. So, uh, Although I, I have to say, without going through all the individual names, that I have been very blessed to have some really incredible teachers from all over the planet. So... Um, you know, you just can't be grateful enough for the the blessing of having really brilliant and awake teachers. Uh, anyway, back to the back to the story. So I think uh, you know, I I had this kind of unfolding of my vision a little bit, and after that, I got very interested in um, in Zen. I was reading a lot on DT Suzuki. Eventually, I went to Japan and started to practice. I had many uh, rich experiences there, came back to the U.S., studied at the Zen Center of Los Angeles uh, for six years I was living there, studying with Maizumi Taizan Roshi and several other teachers who were also teaching there, who uh, Bernie Glassman, Genpo Merzal, Joko Beck, who all have become very well-known people in the Zen world since then. Um, and then... Eventually, I left there, went back to Japan, and somewhere along the way, also gained an interest in tantric Buddhism and started studying Tibetan Buddhism. I had the good fortune, good karma, to meet some great teachers. Uh, His Holiness Gyalwang Drukchen, the head of the Drukpa Kagyu sect, and also uh, Tukor Urjan Rinpoche, who was a really brilliant teacher, I lived in Nepal. I went there to meet him and ended up spending uh, uh, many days in retreat and, and eventually weeks uh, in retreat, uh, going repeatedly to Nepal. Uh, each, you know, each of the great teachers I've studied with, but something else has unfolded. And then uh, after the passing of Tukor Urjan Rinpoche, uh, through, a, through the introduction of a friend, met Namjal Rinpoche, who to my understanding is the first Westerner who was recognized by the Tibetans as a Tuku or a reborn, awakened being uh, who comes back intentionally to help people. So that's the, the idea of what a Tuku is. Um, so I have been in the lineage of Namjal Rinpoche and, and Doug Duncan for the past, well, I guess that would have been 1998 that I went there. Maybe, no, in 1997, so it's a few years. And in the meantime, we've done lots of work together. We built the uh, Clear Sky Meditation and Study Center in British Columbia, where many people have come into uh, new awareness at various depths. Uh, a lot of great work is being done there. And I was very honored to be invited there recently to teach a retreat and uh, to lead a retreat. And I was, this particular retreat is something that's evolved. You know, I was um, more than 20 years in Japan. And my last 
stay there was 21 years altogether, about 25 years in Japan. And while I was there, a friend of mine and myself had invited Doug Duncan to come, and it was around that invitation that we developed this meditation community, although, you know, there were other things going on that I had been involved in, uh, uh, helping and leading people with meditation. But uh, when we invited Doug Sensei, who's a very uh, profound uh, teacher, then uh, a different quality of uh, gathering started to form, and it was very slow, but gradually built into a, a strong group. And eventually we decided to build a meditation center in Canada. Uh, but I was, and, and as Doug Sensei became better known, and especially after Namjal uh, Rinpoche passed away, then uh, Doug was more and more away from Japan during the year, and I was more and more leading that group, and eventually with the help of some of my Dharma brothers and sisters, uh, so I gained a lot there. I got a lot of experience, uh, and we did many, many retreats and all kinds of events, and also uh, traveling, doing Dharma travels, which is one of the ways that my teachers have liked to teach because, you know, you can get people out of their ordinary uh, context by putting them in a retreat. But then there are certain things that won't arise when you're sitting in a meditation hall that will arise when you're undergoing some of the challenges of traveling around, especially if you're in a third world country where people get sick or you're you know, dealing with languages and things you don't understand or you're rooming with somebody you don't get along with. Or, so there, this becomes the context for a different um, dimension of teaching. So my teachers like to do that. We did many travels to different places all over the world. So it's a very multifaceted lineage that I've been working in these past 15 years. And, uh, or is it 16 years? Or is it 17 years? Uh, time runs away. <laughs> uh, so uh, when I was leaving Japan two years ago now, I wanted to, I'd been, you know, very deeply involved, really uh, founding that community uh, with, uh, you know, a uh, friend, John Monroe, who teaches in Tokyo, uh, around uh, Doug Sensei coming to teach there. And um, when I was leaving, I wanted to leave something really valuable. I was thinking those last couple of months there, what can I teach that would really be valuable to these brothers and sisters of mine as I'm leaving. And I struck upon the idea, you know, that I wanted to convey really the essence of meditation. And I think, you know, I I can't uh, hold myself up as a great meditation teacher, but what I can say is that I have a lot to offer based on having made so many mistakes and learned from them. Um, so I wanted to convey the, you know, the benefit of all the things I had done that were great under the guidance of my teachers and all the stupid things I did wandering here and there down side paths and uh, recognized afterward. So I decided to take up this teaching of the Buddha called the Anapanasati Sutta. The problem is it's an extremely profound text and in 16 steps or stages or perspectives it takes you from sitting down and paying attention to your breath to complete awakening. And I wanted to clarify what that path is because I think there are a lot of people all over the world who are pursuing meditation in a way that is self-defeating and with a little bit of guidance could be making much more movement and coming to much greater satisfaction. So I decided to try to take up this text. But the problem is, this is a text that when I took it up myself after about 20 years of meditation, I looked at a discourse by my teacher on it, uh, Namdal Rinpoche's book called The Breath of Awakening. And I put it down after a little while because I said, this is very profound. I need to really practice my way through this in depth. And I spent 
many weeks meditating morning and night for a couple of hours to go through it and really grasp the text. You know, get, I, I won't say I thoroughly penetrated every line of it perhaps, but to go through this commentary and really basically grasp it, the, the meaning of it. So when I wanted to introduce this to people, it was kind of a conundrum. How can I take this thing, which after 20 years took me weeks of many hours a day uh, to penetrate? And I somehow struck upon the idea of guiding people through it as a kind of guided meditation with a kind of concise commentary in it. And I found that to be very useful. People quickly entered into deep states of calm and awareness and were able to very effectively use their meditation time. And if we have a day or a couple of days to work with it, can go through the whole body of the text and grasp something very important about the path to freedom. So this is uh, uh, an approach that I've been using for the last couple of years, and it's been a very fruitful and interesting journey. And I know it's been very meaningful to a lot of people who have come to practice together. Uh, In the last, uh, when I guess it was about a year and a half ago, a little less than a year and a half ago, I went to Mexico and I did for the first time a retreat which was combining this work of the stages of the meditation of the mindfulness of breathing with life revisioning. It's a, a kind of protocol that I've developed. You know, a lot of people in the West especially, are not satisfied to just say, okay, give me a teaching about meditation or take me on some traditional path. But people are concerned, well, I have this issue and this problem and I want to have this in my life. And so, you know, how do I connect this with my life? So I put together, based on a lot of guiding and my own investigations and my own clarifications and a lot of counseling and coaching people over the years, I put together a protocol to take people through an investigation of something, some aspect of their lives that's very important, that they would like to have functioning in a different way. And so we start off with the question about how it is now and what exactly is unsatisfying or disturbing or distressing about it. And then we look at how you would like it to be. You know, how exactly would you like it to be? And get people to start to depict that and to kind of get a clear, positive vision of where they would like to go. And then to look at the qualities that they would need to manifest that vision. And then we start to go into the deeper questions, like uh, how is it that you're contributing to the situation being the way it is. So then we have to get into this very honest self-examination. And uh, when people take this kind of examination up, after expanding the circle of awareness through the practice of meditation, uh, that is meditation with a very clear understanding, and we can talk about that more later, what, what kind of understanding it is and what, many people are missing. But when taken up in that way, uh, this deep examination in the context of the expanded awareness of meditation, people have found that they go very deep and that they uncover and they transform uh, deep issues and deep suffering and blind spots that have been blocking them from moving forward. And there's a huge freedom that emerges in that. So This has been a very interesting and uh, gratifying journey for me to have struck upon this and be able to generate a little bit of fruit out of all the blessings I've received over the years. So I guess uh, that's a pretty long introduction, but I told you it's been a long journey. Well, there's there's a lot there, and it, and I think what you've done is actually kind of touched on some different things 
that are kind of laying the foundation for where we're headed tonight as well. So I think that's good. You brought up some little little pieces uh, along the way there. Uh, so maybe, Paul, maybe a, a good starting point for us is to to understand what Buddhism is all about, since that's mm-hmm. kind of the foundation here of what you're doing. That's true. You know, honestly, I feel that I'm working out of a kind of universalist perspective, but at the same time, my perception has definitely been very much formed by my study of Buddhism over the years from the time I was, I guess, about 19 until now. Uh, And I've had huge influence from that tradition. So certainly it's shaped my viewing to a a significant degree. And also a lot of the tools that I use are Buddhist tools, although when I give a lecture I may quote the Quran and uh, tell some Hasidic stories. And, uh, you know, we're really coming into a, a period of the meeting of great traditions as well. Uh, so, but let me mention, since you're asking about Buddhism, you know, this is not a tradition that's about learning a body of material. Fundamentally, Buddhism, or the, there's no real term Buddhism if you go to Asia. That's a, a Western term. So I guess you're going to have the term Buddha Dharma, or the teaching or truth of the Buddha, and, or the law, if you will. But if you call it law, it's not the law that the Buddha created. It's the law that the Buddha uncovered. Um, and one of the things you mentioned early on this evening was about love. And there's a very beautiful statement by the Buddha in a text called the Dhammapada, which says, that uh, hatred is not vanquished by hatred, but by love alone. So I think we're really getting into some of the core essence of all the great traditions when we touch on that point. The probably most um, significant, unique characteristic of Buddhism is the strength of its delineation of a path. How do you go from the deluded life to the awakened life? And it's an extremely systematic tradition. I wouldn't call it uh, necessarily even a religion. Uh, It doesn't need to be understood that way. But definitely a path to awakening. The term bud means to wake up, to awaken. So Buddha is the awakened one. And the Buddha Dharma is the, the teaching or the law of awakening. How does it work? So this is a a very critical thing to understand. And the Buddha, in his analysis, one of the things he did was say, well, let's look at the character of life. Things are always changing and shifting, but we're trying to hold on to them and treat them as if they're fixed. So this is causing us a lot of suffering. We're always having suffering of many kinds. There's suffering when you get injured, somebody dies, uh, when you know you meet with hardship, when you're hungry, that's a kind of suffering. Then there's a suffering of things changing that you don't want to change uh, because you're clinging on to the idea of them being fixed. Uh, really, it's kind of being out of sync with reality. But Uh, It's also an instinctual thing to grasp after stability. So this is a very big picture issue. How do we overcome the instinctual grasping at the idea of being fixed when in fact things, as we know, practically from the deep wisdom of all the traditions, we know practically when we observe closely, we know from scientific traditions, Everything is in change. How do we deal with that? And uh, one of the core issues that the Buddha took up was the issue of the self. That, you know, when we have a problem, there's always one thing that's there. 
And every time you have a problem, there's one thing that's inevitably there. It's me. So this me, you know, we can we can think about the self in many ways. I don't want to say, okay, no self. And it's definitely the way in which most people relate to the idea of self is quite unexamined. And there is a kind of uh, clinging on to the feeling, not necessarily the intellectual idea, but the feeling that there's some permanent, fixed, substantial core to myself. But if we look very closely, we can notice that, in fact, we are made up of a whole series of streams and all the streams are changing. So we have a, a mental stream, a physical stream, and they're, they're changing. We have thoughts which are always shifting and changing. We have feelings which are always shifting and changing. We have perceptions which are shifting and changing. We have uh, impulses and all kinds of mental uh, mental uh, constructs that are shifting and changing. Our body is always changing. Even your bones are shifting and changing. Cells being replaced. I think I think we lose something like 10 million cells in, in a minute. Uh, really uh, amazing transformation going on in the body. So this is a very key part of the understanding that we're looking through the a kind of a diluted lens, a cloudy lens. We're not really seeing clearly what this thing is. And we're always focused outward. And while we're focused outward, we're protecting and defending and promoting a, a self that has a sense of being fixed and permanent. But if we actually turn the lens inside and take a look at the self, then we find something else. So the Buddha gave a tool which is called the five skandhas or five aggregates, five groupings. Um, and the five groupings, it's a way of deconstructing the concept of self. Not, the, not deconstructing the self because the self is what it is. It, it, we can say it is, we can say it isn't, that's fine. But there's a way in which we relate to the reality, whether we call it self or no self, there's a way in which we relate to it which is quite diluted. Uh, and if we start to examine it, we may come to a much truer sense about it. And the tool that he gave for that is called the five skandhas or five aggregates. First, he said we have the aggregate of form, the, that is the body and its experience. Feeling is next. So we have in each in the experience that we have, both physically and mentally, we might have something that's very pleasant or something that's unpleasant. Yeah? So you may have a physically pleasurable experience of eating something you like or perhaps it's, you know, somebody's rubbing your shoulders or you're having sexual experience or you're just sitting in the sun and enjoying the, the feeling of your own body when you're very relaxed. Or you may have some painful experience. You stub your toe, you have uh, something in your back is out of place, you get sore muscles, you have an accident, whatever. There's pleasant and unpleasant. And then we likewise have very uh, pleasant and unpleasant mental states, mental experiences. So... You know, if somebody is praising you, or you're with somebody you love, you're in a very good space, then it's great. You're having a pleasant mental experience. But then there are the times where your buttons get pushed, that something is really annoying, if somebody's said some things that aren't true, somebody you feel embarrassed, whatever, whatever the situation is, you have some mental distress. So we have these mentally pleasant, unpleasant, and then in each there are also neutral experiences. So, or now neutral can be understood in various ways, but one way is that there's a time where we are not attached to the experience and then it's got its own 
uh, neutrality or uh, we're impartial to it, let's say. So, and then there are some experiences which just don't pull us much either way. You know, we don't we don't have a draw toward them or a push off against them. So we've got all this range of positive and negative feeling, mentally and physical physically. So that's the second one. So we have form and we have feeling, or body and feeling. The next one is perception. You know, I'm talking now and it's vibrating your e- eardrums coming through some electronic waves and then maybe somewhere along the way in some airwaves vibrating your ears. Uh, Maybe you're looking at some console or your computer right now, so you're seeing something. It's making an impression in your eyes, going to your brain. So we have perception. So we have form, feeling, perception. Then we have mental formations. Many different kinds of mental formations. We can have aspiration. We can have disappointment. We can have all kinds of impulses. We can have images, memories, mental conversations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So many different kinds of mental content or mental formations that we have. And then there's consciousness. This is consciousness here means a subject-object consciousness. Fundamentally, whenever we have these five things, we have me. And when we have me, we have these five things. Uh, But because it's a dualistic consciousness, there's always a a kind of dissatisfaction in that uh, experience of the self. So the question is... How do, we, how do we understand that? What happened? This, this is quite philosophical, so I like to tell a story about a, a quite famous sage in the Buddhist tradition. There's a sage named Nagasena. And Nagasena, Nagasena is uh, a sage. He lived uh, after the common era, and he was traveling in the borderlands between the Greek and Indian empires and there was a king named King Melinda who heard that he was traveling that Nagasena was traveling in his domain and he said to one of his servants oh I'd like to meet this Buddhist sage please go and find him and invite him to come to the palace so Nagasena was invited to the palace and at the appointed time on the appointed day he walked palace and the king being respectful, went out in his chariot with some of his retainers and they went out and greeted him. And Nagasena came walking up. The king said, are you the sage Nagasena? And Nagasena gave him the quizzical answer. I am uh, conventionally known as Nagasena. The king scratched his head and said, what do you mean you're conventionally known as Nagasena? So Nagasena pointed to the king's chariot. And he said, Your Highness, is that your chariot? The king said, yes, that's my chariot. And he said, well, if we took off a wheel, is the wheel the chariot? He said, no, the wheel is not the chariot. What if we took off the other wheel and the axle? Is that the chariot? No, that's also not the chariot. Well, how about the floorboard? Is the floorboard the chariot? No, that's also not the chariot. And how about the front board? No. And how about the pole that connects the horses and the chariot? No, it's also not the chariot. What about the reins, the harnesses? He covers everything, and there's no particular thing that makes the chariot. He says, so you have all these things, none of them are a chariot? He said, no. Well, is there some chariot apart from these things? No, there's no chariot apart from these things. He said, and yet conventionally you call it your chariot. So the king says, yes. So in the same way, I'm conventionally known as Nagasena. So in this way, we, we can take apart the chariot and notice that this thing that's called a chariot is a kind of fabrication of our mind. It's really, there are many pieces and parts, each of which can again be taken apart. But when we think of the self, we don't notice that we have a kind of confluence of experience where 
uh, maybe we can call it uh, an emergent property. The self is an emergent property. It has a body and feeling, perception, and uh, wonderfully creative, brilliant, multifaceted mental formations. There's a wondrous consciousness that, that, that makes it up. But we treat it as if there's a, a thing there that we call self. When we start to notice all of these streams of our experience, then things lose their boundary in a way. They lose the hard shell around this idea of self. And things begin to flow in a different way. So this is a very valuable teaching. It's worth reflecting on. People often think that meditation is about not thinking. But uh, in the Buddhist tradition, there are many kinds of analytical meditations. And they're meditations that we take to deconstruct our deluded views and see more clearly. Of course, that they are, there are also non-conceptual meditations to go with them. But we shouldn't think that not thinking is all of meditation because thinking can be a huge hindrance, but the resistance to thinking can also be a huge hindrance. So I, I would say that this is really starting to pinpoint the essence of the Buddhist tradition. If you really want to know what Buddhism, Buddhism is about, it's taking apart the core of the delusion of the way we view the world. And that core delusion of self really conditions our perceptions, our feelings, everything about us in a very strong way, needless to say, all of our relationships and the way we act in the world. So when we take apart the core delusion intellectually, then we can start to leave space and eventually it will collapse, at least temporarily. And then we can start to integrate that experience and gradually stabilize ourselves in a much more realistic way of relating to the world. Now, the realistic way of relating to the world may feel like it's lacking in some of the exciting stimuli stimuli that used to really move me and turn me on. But if we look closely, we find out that the satisfaction we were deriving from those stimuli, the contentment, the, the, the joy that was coming from those is already there. It's something that's really part of our inherent being. And it's not something that we're going to get from the outside. So there's a, a famous uh, Zen koan says uh, the essence of it is the family treasure does not come, come from outside the door. And uh, another uh, famous uh, dictum in Zen, a bright jewel in your hand. It's already there, right, right with us. And the Quran says, God is closer to you than your juggler vein. So I think that this, uh, I would say, a direct addressing of the core delusion and laying out of a path to freedom and to peace. But these are the most characteristic pieces of the Buddhist tradition. And I think that's great because I think that sometimes we get these terms thrown around and people don't mm -hmm. really get to understand this type of foundation and and what it's about. And, mm -hmm. and I think important and it seems like that really ties in with this work that you're doing both in uh, changing patterns and in life revisions um, because both of those aspects to me anyways and, and hopefully you'll uh, talk a little bit more about what you do with those things um, that's kind of what you're doing when you're changing patterns you're, you're getting in there you're getting deep you're breaking it down, you're understanding it, you're taking the parts, <laughs> the pieces apart and mm -hmm. putting them back together again 
to create a different picture in your life. Right. Yep, it's exactly like that. And um, I think the this meditative piece on this understanding of self, this new way of understanding the self, perhaps we can say not as a fixed object, but as a process. I, I like the image of the self as a stream, and there are always different rivulets coming in and water seeping up from the, you know, from the ground underneath and rain coming into it. The number of influences uh, by which the self is created are uh, innumerable. And also, if we, we're not going to make the stream turn from north to east in one day, but if we start to make choices, then we can definitely shift the direction of the stream. So we have to know that that it is a process. It's not a fixed thing. And we don't need to uh, blame ourselves because where that stream is right now is the fruit of many, many things. And in the past, we made the decisions that we could make based on what our understanding was at that time. Of course, we should be responsible for our decisions, and we need to recognize that we have a lot of power in shifting things, potential. But the idea of blaming ourselves is really just compounding the problem because we're, again, treating the self as a fixed object. You know, of course, if you do something which is insufficient or harmful, uh, based on strong conditioning, which in fact we all have, then to feel remorseful for it or embarrassed about it, ashamed, is not necessarily a bad thing. But to build an identity around that feeling is not a healthy thing. We need to allow the feelings to process through fully. And this is really a big piece of the life revisioning work is that we need to meet all of our experiences uh, wholly. And one of the things about this meditation is that uh, if we, we look at the four foundations of mindfulness, which is related to the teaching of the five aggregates, uh, we are looking basically at our whole life, all of the things that make up our experience of life and we're observing them carefully. When we start to do that, we find things much more workable and we ourselves become much more malleable. So when people have a problem with something, as long as they are hooked into blaming me or blaming somebody else, uh, then it's very hard to move things. But when people can start to look at themselves as a kind of stream into which many influences have flowed and to recognize that they can also make choices about the direction and, and about what they put into that stream. And in fact, we do have a mind stream and we can feed it with healthier or unhealthier content. And that's a really important thing to realize that very much our life is determined by what we feed ourselves. That's a choice that we're making every day, all day. So uh, we should put an effort toward feeding ourselves healthy things. But there's another piece which is, you know, it's it's very natural for us to be um, to protect ourselves and to avoid pain coming at us. It's a natural survival mechanism. Thank heaven we have it. But uh, sometimes in the failure to examine our own experience carefully, we also don't distinguish the pain which may be coming at us externally in the present moment from the pain which has already been embedded in our nervous system in the past. And that pain, is, if it's unprocessed, is going to be pressed down uh, into the subconscious and it will be running our life. So 
what we need to do is create a bigger vessel, a stronger vessel, so that those experiences can arise without knocking us over, without breaking us, so we can become strong enough to let those things arise gradually, one after the other, and process through and move. And that happens when we put ourselves in settled, peaceful, focused states, the very pleasant states. But we are not going to sit down in meditation, uh, very likely, and enter into a peaceful, blissful state and stay there forever. What will happen, and, and actually it shouldn't happen, because you can actually get into one of those states and stay for a very, very long time. In Buddhist cosmology, it's known as a, a deva state or a, a, the god realm. But the discussion of the god realm is that you are there based on good karma, but you're clinging to the pleasant fruit of that. And when the karma is exhausted, you're going to crash and fall into a hell state. So let's say a hell state could be state of anger or depression uh, disorientation, and we should cultivate every kind of good state, but we shouldn't cling to those good states because if we really want to go on the path to freedom, we have to be willing to allow every experience that's already embedded in us, either personally or even in the collective consciousness. Uh, you know, whether you want to view it as Jung's collective unconscious or the Alaya Vishnana, the storehouse consciousness that's talked about in Buddhism, we're going to p- gradually penetrate deeper and deeper and go into all of the things in the personal unconscious or subconscious and old, forgotten, and painful things will definitely arise. And if we block them, we're stopping our own movement, our own unfolding. And if we are able to say, to distinguish between some threat that's coming at us in the moment externally and some discomfort or uh, pain or disturbing emotions or experiences that are arising from within, and we can embrace whatever is arising in our experience in that moment, then it will process through. And no matter whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant experience, if we embrace it fully, it becomes a doorway into oneness. And then everything is moving in a much better way. And pleasant or unpleasant is not such a big deal because we're embraced in a a larger state of oneness, which in itself I guess you can say is very pleasant or certainly brings along pleasant states. So there is a sense in which we want to we want to approach, we want to pursue the pleasant, the blissful, the beautiful, the peaceful. But if we try to pursue it by cutting out that which is unpleasant or disturbing that's already in us, then we're going to be blocking our own true unfolding. So it's very important to get this rounded view about what meditation is. In that sense, the four foundations uh, is a very useful practice. We have the awareness of the body, awareness of feeling, awareness of mental state, and awareness of the content of mind. And as we let these each come and arise and we examine them a little bit, we have to be like a scientist using a microscope where something comes up And whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, you want to really look very, very closely at it. What's the texture of it? What's the response to it? What's the breath that goes with it? How how is the feeling and the mental content connected? And so we, we really want to start to notice everything without grasping onto it. So really the the key here is non clinging awareness. And if we're able to cultivate that then more and more we unfold our potential and we do actually cultivate these states of joy and bliss and peace that are very deep 
and that become very strong and increasingly stable resources for us, a place we can go by choice, that we can have access to more and more easily. Yes, and I I think these are very key things, and and you bring up some key points such as embracing fully uh, Mm -hmm. whatever it is that's coming up. And we're trained a lot of times, at least in Western society, oh, don't feel that, don't think about that. Um, Instead of being trained, you need to embrace this. You need to go Mm -hmm. through it. You need to understand it. And then it stops having power over you. Right, precisely. Uh, and and I think and that I, this is a big thing in today's life where people feel very powerless in a lot of ways because they get very, uh, what I call in a drone pattern, um, very robotic, very day in, day out, monotony sort of thing, and they don't mm-hmm. stop and really embrace what's happening for them. I, I think that's true, and I think the fruit of that is that, I mean, when I look around, I see most of the people on the planet far undershooting their potential. And what what would they do if they had confidence? And what would what would each person have accomplished if they had real confidence in their in themselves? Uh, if they really felt if they really recognize what their own capacities were. And I think this is a kind of awareness that when we let those things process through, when we start to recognize the self as a stream, when we recognize that we are a stream of possibilities, then that kind of confidence begins to build in us and we start to manifest our potential much more. And in fact, I would say that more or less everybody deserves more. And now, when I say that, I, I don't mean that the world owes people more because it's not about entitlement. I think entitlement is one of the plagues of our modern society. But every person deserves more cause they deserve to give attention to their own inner and outer needs and the desires of their own heart. You know, we, we're not going to make our best contribution to the world if we're not following the song of our own heart, if we're not living to the tune of our own heart, if we don't hear the messages of our own heart and step in that direction and unfold the gifts, not the gifts that somebody else thinks I should be given, but the gifts that are actually in me the gifts that really come to life and bring me to life. And when we start to unfold those, then we're making a contribution, which is way beyond what we can do when we're trying to meet somebody else's expectations and not living according to what's really in us. So in that sense, everybody deserves more uh, rooted in compassion toward themselves. Uh, one of one of the things I like, uh, you know, Henry David Thoreau has the quote: "Most men lead lives of quiet desperation, and go to the grave with their songs still in them." You know, it's mm-hmm. a kind of sad, sad message. But we have a chance to let our song be sung, and in a way, I guess that's what I feel like I'm trying to do with this work. You know, I I recently led a nine-day retreat, a meditation life revision retreat at the Clear Sky Meditation and Study Center in British Columbia. And when I finished that, I just had this feeling, I just wish I could do this with every young person on the planet and with every troubled person on the planet because it's so gratifying to see people move out of that place where they're being controlled by unconscious wounds to a place of grieving them, releasing them, and having a space of conscious awareness and freedom in place of it, and excitement and possibility. 
So, Absolutely. you know, it's available to us. Absolutely it is. And uh, such such important points that you're bringing up here. Now, you did have a meditation that you were going to offer up, or at least a shortened version of a meditation mm-hmm. that you work with. Mm-hmm. Um, give us just a little intro to that, and maybe we can go ahead and go into that where people can start to get some of this experience. Okay, that's a great idea. Uh, what I'd like to say about it is the, I'll lead it in a slightly informal way, but it's the a form, a, a kind of informal form I'd like to lead us, of part of the four foundations of mindfulness that I mentioned before, the body, feeling mental states and objects of mind or or contents of consciousness. <clears throat> uh, if you look at this, as I said before, pretty well, this encompasses our experience. And if we get a really clear perception of this, sometimes we see the whole arising of this thing I call me. And there's a huge awareness, a huge freedom in recognizing that. Uh, But if another way of looking at this, uh, the Anapanasati Sutta has four tetrads, tetrad meaning four steps or four stages. So it's four times four. And there's four steps for each of these four foundations. And I would say that these are steps through which the Buddha guides us to a wholesome experience in each of the foundations. Now, we can't really work our way through it. Uh, you know, usually I spend a whole day or a couple of days, a weekend, to introduce that material. It's extremely you know, profound teaching and has huge depth in it. But let's try to take the first portion of it, which is the awareness of the body. And the approach to it is through breathing, uh, just to pay attention to the breathing. And I'll mention one thing which is quite significant, I think, that it begins not with uh, training ourselves in any way, but it simply begins with recognizing the quality of the breath that we have in this moment and starting to put our attention fully on it and recognize its quality. There are a lot of meditations, uh, especially if you go into the yogic tradition, and I've I've worked with uh, many of them, you know, doing uh, pranayama or you can have some, you know, if you go into kundalini yoga, breath of fire, and if you're working with the pranayama uh, breath regulation in the yoga tradition, depending on whether you then the in-breath, the length and the out-breath, you can calm the mind, you can pull up emotions, you can do all kinds of things. You can balance the mind. There are a lot of things you can do, and these are wonderful tools. However, in this meditation, breathing is being treated in a completely different way. It's not being managed in any way. It's simply being observed however it is. And as we proceed in this meditation, we begin to recognize a lot of things about the breath and that there is a a certain kind of breath that goes with each different state that we're in. So it also is a very good focus for concentration because pretty well your breath is always with you. So whether you're sitting on a cushion or doing walking meditation or walking downtown, or driving in a car, riding on a bus, you can use your breathing as a way of anchoring your awareness. And that's that's a very useful thing to become uh, conditioned to. I would say you mentioned healthy and unhealthy patterns before. And uh, certainly that would be a pattern that would be a very healthy one to link my recognition or noticing of my breath to deep states of awareness and calm. Uh, you know, quite a lovely lovely thing to have as a, as a pattern and a habit. So we can definitely cultivate good habits. Uh, so let's take a, a little run through here. And I'll just, I'll just give a brief one more piece of that. The first two steps here, we're paying attention to the way things are. That is, the breath is going in long or 
uh, going out long, breathing in and breathing out long. In the second step, breathing in short or breathing out short. Then this, this is just simply how is it in this moment? The reason this is so important is that if we want to do anything in our lives, we really have to start with a sense of what is the reality now? And if we start somewhere else, we're definitely going to miss important pieces and things will not come to a fruitful development. So we begin with this simply noticing how it is. And then we begin in the third step with what I would call cultivation or training. So in the third step, we're told the experiencing the whole body, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body I shall breathe out. So now there's a kind of conscious intention to be aware of the whole body. It may not need to be done intentionally because usually when we pay attention to the breathing and we focus on it well, the awareness expands naturally to the whole body. And in fact, I would say that the whole of this meditation is a kind of, through the 16 stages, is a kind of natural evolution, kind of natural unfolding. So then it may be that when we move to the third step, people already have the whole body awareness. If not, then the language may evoke it because we certainly all have the experience of the whole body or the capacity to experience the whole body. When we do that, we come into detailed, gradually more detailed awareness. We should let our awareness penetrate the body more and more and notice all the different activities going on. An itch, the feeling of your body against your chair, cushion, the air on your skin, movement of of gas inside your body, air inside your body, uh, the feeling of your organs, how full is your stomach, how do your muscles feel, different sensations of many, many kinds. And if we start to pay more attention, we'll feel more and more and more and our awareness will deepen more and more. We may come across something in the body which is not fully relaxed, though, something a little intransigent, a little stubborn, stubbornly hanging on. And if that happens, although as we enter into this more detailed awareness, if we're holding it in the space of non-clinging, non-clinging awareness, then these things tend to release. They come into awareness. We let them enter fully. We give them their space and they release. But if they don't release, then we can send a gentle message or a gentle intention on the breath to that area of the body. And when we do that, we can also let our awareness penetrate very directly and deeply into that experience. What is that experience in the nerves, in the muscles, in the bones? How how are we holding it? What exactly is going on? And let our awareness penetrate more and more into it. And send it the message of calming. So this is the the portion on the body. So we can take a run through it now. We'll take a few minutes and See how it Perfect. goes. Perfect. Thank you for the invitation. So yes. uh, if all the listeners would sit straight, either they can sit themselves on a cushion on the floor with their uh, bottom higher than their knees so that the back can stay erect without a lot of muscular effort, or if they're sitting in a chair in a nice square posture with feet on the ground and the thighs on the seat of the chair, and one hand on each thigh. So a nice uh, straight posture, not rigid, but erect. Then let the awareness fall to the breathing. For now, let's just say the eyes can be open or closed. And if they're open, you can let them rest in space about an arm's length in front of you, directly straight forward. Not down, not up, not left, not right. And let the attention fall onto the breathing. Feel the breath going in and out of the nostrils. And just let it stay at the entry point or the place where you feel it most strongly.
and keep the awareness on that place at the nostrils where the air enters or maybe it's a little up in the nose or on the, the lip as the breath comes across it. And simply let your natural knowing recognize what kind of breath it is. So if you're breathing in long, you know that you're breathing in long. And if you're breathing out long, you know you're breathing out long. Or if it's a short breath, you know you're breathing in short and breathing out short. And you recognize if it's a rough or smooth breath, halting or flowing whether it's a deep breath or a shallow breath. So let your awareness fall really fully onto the breathing as the breath goes in and out. the mind wanders, simply bring it back wherever the mind energy has gone. Acknowledge, notice what the mind has gone to thinking about. And then bring the attention back and pour it fully into the breathing. And as we focus in this way, we tend to become aware of the whole body. The awareness expands out to the whole body. We have the sense of it as a single piece. And if your awareness has not unfolded there yet, perhaps you can let these words call it into your whole body. And simply notice what you're feeling, whatever experiences are arising, give them their own place. If they're pleasant, unpleasant, perhaps it's an itch or a twitch or a warm feeling in your heart or an energy running in your spine or your feet touching the floor. Whatever experience arises, one after the next, give each one its own space to arise and to dissolve away on its own. And as we allow the experiences to arise and dissolve, according to themselves, more and more things release and we become increasingly relaxed and calm, come into a peaceful state. There is some tension tightness or holding or discomfort or pain that's hanging on, you can send a gentle message, a subtle intention to that place. Breathe right into that spot. with the message of calming, calming, or releasing. Coming to ease. Take a minute and see what our experience has been in each of the four foundations. So, what has transpired 
in the experience of the body and the awareness of the body during this brief meditation. Hmm. And then see if you can find a few highlights at least about what has happened in the feeling body, in the experience of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, either physically or mentally. How has the awareness evolved? And then the awareness of mental states. You know, we go through so many states. Um, We may be tense, interested, excited, bored, distressed, tense, angry, passionate, blissful. So many states. What are the states that were passed through during this meditation? And finally, what about the contents of the mind? What kind of images and thoughts? What kind of impulses? What memories? What feelings arose? What what kind of emotional contents came up? So, Jesse, how'd you enjoy that? I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, you know, it's it's amazing any time I find when we stop and really place that awareness in. Um, and, it, and it's amazing. I was watching the different things with my own body shift from where it started and I was noticing, you know, even before I got on the show tonight, wow, my body feels like it's really stiff tonight. And then after being in that, my body has the ability to move. <laughs> you know, it's, a, uh, it's just even some of those subtleties for me that make huge differences because I know that where it was before and where it is now um, – they indicate so much more than the physical body Mm -hmm. on on there. So very powerful. Man, I could just imagine, I mean, we've done this in a short period of time, but what it would be like to take this on multiple depths and levels. And I can Mm -hmm. see where that would create some very powerful transformations for people. Yeah, this is well. That's the experience people have been having, and um, you know, I also, you know, sometimes I have to bring myself back to start talking again. You know, it, uh, <laughs> go quite far far into it, and I, it's like, oh yes, right. What's the next step? <laughs> I, I've been there when I've bought some courses too, so I know that feeling. Like, oh wait, I gotta <laughs> come back. But, we, we we might need a kind of prompter. So. <laughs> <laughs> I you know I so appreciate you sharing this exercise uh, with people or this piece of what you do because I know it's just one piece um, of it. And I would love for you to share with people maybe some events that you have coming up and how they can reach you. Um, Mm -hmm. and to delve more into this work with you? Well, in fact, um, I don't have a lot of things put on the schedule right now, although this evening we were talking about scheduling a retreat for uh, maybe a short retreat, one day or two days, for September. So uh, I'm looking at doing things probably coming up in the fall, although... 
if there are groups of people who would like to do something, then I can also think about doing something during the summer. Uh, I have a few other kinds of things planned in the summer. So I, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm not going to organize something myself, but I'm always open to people who would like to sponsor something or organize something. And uh, fairly soon uh, we'll be deciding on some dates in the fall to run uh, workshops and seminars, retreats, and looking at that. Uh, there is one other thing I didn't talk about at all, which is uh, my, you know, I thought it was very interesting, the song you began with, uh, which talks about Shabbat, and uh, very nice, beautiful, uh, the the way it discusses the whole cosmic perspective um, but I've been also working with my friend Ruben Modek, and uh, we've been doing uh, Jewish Buddhist approaches to spiritual, Jew, Jewish and Buddhist approaches to spirituality, and that's been quite a lot of fun. And we also will be planning a couple of more retreats along those lines coming up within the next year. Uh, so. There's a lot of different things that are going on. And uh, people can f contact me through my website and also find out about things as they're scheduled on the website, a little bit about my lineage. I will be putting up some... Uh, I haven't put up a lot of content yet, but I have some things that are in process that will be going up there. And I do plan actually to put together a talk and a recorded meditation uh, on this theme. But it's a little bit of a longer-term project to do it the way I would like to do it, which is in a very thorough way. So those are some things. Again, the uh, website is www.stepstofreedom.org. Steps to Freedom is all one word and dot org uh, so people can contact me there if they would like and look at uh, something about the lineage and start to get a little information and I'm you know delighted to receive inquiries and comments from people and if any of the listeners have comments of course I'm very delighted to hear from them and I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity also to be able to share a little bit of what I've experienced and what's evolved for me. Well, well, definitely it's a pleasure, I know, for our listeners to get to experience this, and this is what I love, that we've got the podcast available and we've got the YouTube version so that people can really come back and listen at their will and uh, uh, listen to this over and over again, which is, mm -hmm. I, I think, a real gift that you've come on and shared this. And and again, I encourage people to, to go to your website, check out some of the things you have. And again, you mentioned that um, you'd certainly be open to going someplace if people have a group uh, that they mm -hmm. would like you to come to and work with. And, and they can find out all of this at stepstofreedom.org. Um, Paul, how about just a little... Um, summary point that maybe you want to leave our listeners with. Okay, well, you know, there is one more piece that I wanted to touch on, which is, you know, this sound, it all sounds very nice to have these, these great experiences, and in fact, we should cultivate these experiences as much as we can. But there's one thing which I think is a very big point which we haven't touched on, and that is the point of forgiveness. And it's not only about forgiving other people, but it's about forgiving ourselves and not beating ourselves up. You know, I mentioned a little bit having compassion on ourselves. But um, I think that a lot of people can be quite critical of themselves. And when, you know, we fall down, we make mistakes, we're subject to uh, very powerful and deep and old conditioning. And this is a path 
for basically deconditioning all of the old patterns that control us. Not that we're not going to have patterns, but hopefully that our patterns will be more conscious. You know, as you said before, there could be good and bad patterns, or maybe from a Buddhist perspective, we'd like to mention wholesome and unwholesome patterns. And those wholesome meaning really conducing to wholeness. And that's, you know, such a satisfying place. And uh, dropping away gradually the unwholesome path. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to have a kind of gentleness with ourselves, a kind of forgiveness. I mean, because we all fall down. We all do things that we wish we could have a do-over on. And I would say the more conscious we become, the more we feel that way. And if we want to create a kind of psychic environment in which we can become more conscious, then we have to take the judgment off. We have to release ourselves from the harshness that we often deliver because we've been trained to do that. And we have to really have compassion toward ourselves as well as others. And in fact, I think the more compassion you have toward yourself, the more you can have toward others. And I know, I mean, this is this is your whole thing. We're on compassion in the midnight hour. And it's uh, getting exactly. to midnight. So I think, I don't know if that's a summary, but uh, I think that's a really <laughs> big point. And I think it does touch on a lot of things we've covered because if you understand the true nature of the self as a process, as a flow, then it will be much easier to have that attitude and to move in a positive direction and to keep, to use this instrument that we have in the best way. So I I hope that's a good enough summary. Absolutely it is. And I think that 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 is a key point. And and we definitely need that forgiveness itself as we're delving into work to change ourselves and to change our patterning and to to do this type of work um, because things are going to come up and it's very easy to get into that guilt and that shame and all of these spaces. So I think forgiveness is an incredibly great summary point for this evening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Paul, you know, I really want to thank you for being with us tonight, for giving us your time. Uh, Our listeners don't know your full day completely, but he's been going (laughs) from early this morning through one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing, and we're wrapping up his day for him. And so it truly is a, an honor to have you here and to be sharing your piece of wisdom and your piece of compassion with us. Well, thanks, Jesse. And, and your show is kind of unique because you really, uh, you kind of put, directed, you know, pointed me in a certain direction and you let me run so I could really... Uh, talk in some depth about the themes that are important to me. So, and the themes, you know, the things that I think have been really beneficial to people and go into some depth so I can see why your listeners must enjoy your show because you really let people bring out, you know, more than a sound bite. (laughs) So so thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you every good thing. Well, thank you very I'll much. Look I, to talking, I'll look forward to talking to you more and uh, hope to see you out here in New York sometime. Uh, you know, I was just, I had a friend that messaged me earlier and he's like, when are you coming to New York? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't know <laughs> yet, but it may not be that long. <laughs> All right, great. Well, I'll look forward to it. Thanks a lot. I look forward to it as well. Thank you so much. And next week here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, I'm going to have Nicola Bird on my show, and she's going to be sharing her work with the boomerang effect, and that's going to be talking about breakthroughs, making changes, releasing trauma, and and more along those lines. So this is really great because we had Paul this week who was talking about how to change some patterns and things like that, and she's going to be kind of continuing uh, with her style and her thoughts on some of these things as well. And my books, uh, again, on relationships have been released. All of my books and 
uh, you can find on my website, jessianniclesgeorge, the number one, dot com. If you go right on there, you'll find on the products tab a uh, thing for my products, and, and you'll be able to look up the books, and that will give you links to, to purchase from there. I've also released several events for 2014, and you can check those out at jessianniclesgeorge.eventbrite.com. Now, I've got a lot of different work. These, these events that are going on are absolutely amazing. We uh, are working in nature, so nature is our classroom or our meeting place, and oftentimes when I'm doing these events, we're traveling through different spots, so it's not like we're just sitting in one spot in nature. Um, I've been working around the Zion National Park area with some of these events lately, and we actually go through multiple biospheres and things like that, so it's a it's a great, fun way to spend the day and delve into yourself and get into some of that depth. And I've got a lot of different things actually on the event coming up in June. If you go in and you register for that event and pay for it before the end of May, uh, you can get a 25% off discount. And you can find that on my homepage on my website, jessianniclesgeorge, the number one dot com. And that will give you all the information on how to do that. And also on the website, you're going to find upcoming shows, archived shows, video tips. I just released a new video tip during the last week, so you want to check that out. Um, all those different avenues there. So lots and lots to, to delve into, blog posts, the whole works there. Uh, also, we've got a Main Street Universe tab, and that's going to give you a chance to know a little bit about all of our shows and hosts. Uh, that are part of the Main Street Universe Network, and that's all listed at the bottom of the show description. For those that can't see it, again, it's jessianniclesgeorge, the number one, dot com. Don't forget, we've got several shows here on the network. Throughout the week, Sunday nights, we have Darren Bouquer, who's a reader at Madame Laveau in New Orleans, doing Spiritual Insights. Monday nights, Randy Goldberg, working with Vedic Astrology. Tuesdays is Susan Weed, who's sharing her works in herbs and natural plants. And, and actually, I'm going to be sitting in for Daniel this week on Tuesday night and, uh, and uh, um, just kind of being there for Susan. And she's got an amazing show. It's short, but she packs a whole lot of information in it. Wednesday nights, we have Daniel, Janice, and Brett on our flagship show called Main Street Universe. Thursdays, we have Queen Mother Amaku, who looks at Egyptian culture. Fridays, Kevin Baird, Walking on the Sidewalk. He comes on a little earlier in the day from me, and uh, he works with his Horizon Oracle's Journey deck, a deck that he created. You can learn more about that deck at his website, templeofgaia.com. And then, of course, Friday nights, we have Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. Hey, this is Jesse Ann Nichols-George, and I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. And again, thanks to all of our listeners not only on Blog Talk, but also those streaming live through Penn, also known as Pair Encounters Network, Stream Finder, and Talk Stream Live, as well as those that are catching our podcast at iTunes, TuneIn.com, and those catching the YouTube version of our show. A special thanks to uh, tonight's sponsor as well, Earth Goddess Rising, and I also look forward to seeing you here next week as we delve more into activating compassion. Don't forget if you've enjoyed my show this evening to share it with others. It's going to be available at the same link in our archives immediately following the show as well as in the other sources that I mentioned. I'm going to be leaving you with the song tonight, Yearning For, also known as Over and Over, also by Shemshai, who we opened the show with. Thanks so much. I look forward to seeing you again next week right here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have an absolutely amazing week. The first Earth Goddess Rising Retreat is set for July 11, 12, and 13 of 2014 and will be held in stunning Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Come join us with other men and women from around the world for yoga, meditation, classes, organic meals, dance, and music festivities, healing workshops, hot mineral springs, and more. Want more information? Visit earthgoddessrising.com and cash in on the early bird ticket sales, earthgoddessrising.com. And if I could see what makes me blind, I would soar to the edge of my mind. And to touch what seems unreal, just to show you the way that I feel. And we are in time with time. One with season of change inside And we are in tune with the two Caught in a balance of sun and moon All deep inside
Thank you. 